So last week, we talked about the power of conviction as we entered into this uh, series, this learning series called Power. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about last week the power of conviction. He convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the Holy Spirit is not our conscience. He does not just convict us of what is right and what is wrong. He is not here to condemn us. He doesn't just tell us how we're doing the wrong thing and make us feel guilty and ashamed and, and condemned. No, no, no. He, t- he convicts us of sin, yes, but also of righteousness, that we have been made righteous, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Then he convicts us of judgment at the same time that we have power over sin because the devil has been defeated and we don't have to sin anymore. And so if you struggle with sin, if you struggle with an addiction, if you struggle with some kind of sinful thing in your life, I want to encourage you, go to the Revive Church app, watch that message 10 times a day and get that into your heart. Today though, I want to talk to you about the power of truth. Everybody say truth truth. And in the first week, we talked about this concept of what I'm calling self-guided spirituality, self-guided spirituality. It's the notion or the idea that I don't need a deity or a God or a religion. I don't need a pastor or a bishop or a priest. I don't need a friend or an adult to tell me what is right or what is wrong. I can figure this out internally. Uh, my conscience will guide me or my beliefs will guide me. And so there's a lot of people right now who are operating in this self-guided spirituality. We got this from 2 Timothy 3, 5 in the first week, having a form of godliness but denying its power. It's the idea that I am operating in some kind of godly power, some kind of godly identity. I'm doing what is right, and so it's a good thing, but it also denies the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. And so I I really knew that we had to dive in deep into the subject of the Holy Spirit for our church and for everybody online, all of our family online who checks in every week, because I think this might be the missing ingredient for people's lives, is the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the concepts of self-guided spirituality is that there is an open idea of truth. There's a, a large fluidity of truth. There's an idea right now that says that uh, we should have kind of a utopia where people are, are, are having all kinds of different truths in their lives, and that's okay, that we should all accept and affirm whatever your personal truth is. And we can all just get along with that. Um, and the idea sounds good. It does sound good. I wish it was that way. But if we can be honest with each other, when we find out that someone has a differing opinion than us, Internally, it does rub us a little bit the wrong way. And I'm not talking about theologically either. I'm talking about who's your favorite sports team? Come on. (laughs) Who's your favorite athlete? Who's your favorite pop star? Whatever you want to say, right? Who's your favorite master chef? Whatever. But we have this internal struggle to accept and affirm somebody else's truth if we believe differently than them. But each new generation brings a culturally indulged thought process or a culturally indulged truth. My parents' generation brought about the truth of discipline. My dad believed that if you were going to win at something, if you were going to be the best at something, you had to be disciplined. You had to perform a task over and over and over until you got it right. I played t-ball when I was a kid. I had no business playing t-ball. Eventually, they moved me up to coach pitch, which I had no business playing coach pitch either. But when I was in coach pitch, I was the catcher. I don't know what, I, I can barely bend down like this far, but squatting for like an hour straight was the worst. And I was really bad at catching. I didn't have good hand-eye coordination. I still don't. I'm a lanky kid. That's just who I was. So my dad, to help me learn how to catch better, got me a pitch back. And what this was, it was a, a huge net on a steel frame, and it had a big, round, uh, or a big box in the middle of it. And you would throw the ball in that box, and it would pitch it back to you. The net would catch it, and it would throw it right back to you. And my dad thought that would help me catch better. So my dad would make me go out there every single day, throw the ball, catch it, throw the ball, catch it, throw the ball, catch it. Why? Because he believed that discipline is how you win. If you want to be the champion, you discipline yourself. Now, there's a brand new thought, a brand new truth that's showing up more and more that says that discipline is not what's important. It's the fact that everyone should win. And so if your kid was just on the team, even though he was a bench warmer, he should get a trophy. 
You don't have to be first place. It's not important who wins. It's just important that you had fun. And here's the thing. If we took both of these truths, if we took somebody who believes strongly in both of those truths, we sat them in a room, and we said, okay, have a discussion about this. Man, both sides would have some great points. The discipline side would tell you that there is science that backs up how discipline, doing something over and over and over again, ingrains in your brain how to do it better, and you become better at it. But then on the other side, there would be somebody who would say, but yes, but if you tell a kid that they're a loser, you're not nurturing them, and you're making them feel bad. And so there's psychology that shows that you need to encourage your kids, and this is a way to encourage. You would have some great points, but here's the bottom line. Both sides would be right because they believe their own truth, and neither of them would walk away going, you know what, I believe what you believe now. In fact, both sides would be way more ingrained in what they believe in the first place. Oh, you've never had a disagreement with somebody? <laughs> you know when you sit down with somebody and you get real heated about it, what happened? you don't walk away going, maybe they are right. You walk away going, I know they wrong. I, everything they said was wrong. Because why? We have different truths. There's a new truth uh, from the millennials, I believe, that's really uh, become a hardcore truth just in the past decade, and I think that it's springing up in the next generation. It's this truth that we have to have a life of achievement. Achievement looks different to everybody, but I think there's a a common thread right now that that ties this together, that achievement is not about, uh, you know, winning a baseball game, but it's more about how many followers I have on social media. Because if I can just be honest with you, there are 16-year-old girls who have millions of followers on Instagram, and if they take a tube of lipstick and put it on on their TikTok, they get paid my annual salary for this because they are called influencers. And nowadays, I see some shaking of the head. Let me just say, this is the new reality we live in, people. Nowadays, there are students, teenagers, and even kids who are struggling mentally because they want to be an influence. They want to be identified as somebody who's important on social media, and so they work really hard and try to be creative, and then they only get five likes on a video, and depression hits because they haven't achieved their goals. There's an achievement factor in the millennial generation that used to spring up a lot, that if I'm not married by the time I graduate college at 21 with a 4.0 GPA and I don't have three kids and a dog named Lassie and a white picket fence by the age of 27 and we haven't traveled to six continents by the time I'm on 35 and if I don't hit millionaire status, money stacks on stacks on stacks by the age of 40, then I'm a failure. We have this achievement culture, a truth that is just ingraining itself in the culture right now that says you have to achieve, and this is what achievement looks like. And it all springs from the idea that we have access to so many people's lives. I never would have known there was a 16-year-old girl on TikTok who puts a tube of lipstick on and she makes a million dollars. I never would have known that if I hadn't got on TikTok. I never would have known that I've got people I went to high school with who are way more successful than me. Never would have known if I hadn't got on Instagram. But I have an unfiltered, unadulterated look at everybody else's life, and so it's easy for me to master the art of comparison. And over the past decade, as we've had these glimpses and these transparencies into people's lives, because we don't see ourselves as achieving like them, it's also raised the bar of anxiety and depression and comparison and stress. It's easy to master the art of comparison. The book of Ecclesiastes said this. King Solomon wrote this in the book of Ecclesiastes 1.9. He says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything is just recycled. Any ideology that is created, any real opinion, even science sometimes can be recycled from previous generations. Empires just recycle previous empires. Thought leaders just recycle the thoughts of other thought leaders. There's really nothing new under the sun. We are just repeating what we have learned from someone else. And a lot of times when we think of truth, we think of these two questions, what or why. But what would happen if we took the truths that we have identified ourselves with and started instead asking who? Who gave me this truth? Who influenced me to believe this? 
Who is the person that showed me this in the first place? I want to talk to you about the power of truth as it relates to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. In John 16, this is where we were at last week. Quick recap. Here's what Jesus said. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. Jesus said, I'm peacing out, and here's why. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the helper, will not come. But when I depart, I'll send him to you. And when he's come, he'll convict the world of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, that was last week. Let's get into next, this week. I, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of, pay attention, what's that word? Spirit. Truth has come. He will guide you into all, what's that word? truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He'll glorify me. Speaking of Jesus, he said the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus because he will take of what belongs to Jesus, and he will speak it. He will declare it to us. All things the Father has are Jesus. Therefore, he said that the Holy Spirit will take of what is his, and he will declare it to us. I want to give you three facts about the power of truth as it relates to our encounters and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number one is this. The power of truth is personal. The power of truth is personal. Whatever you believe today, I said ask the question who. Here's why. Because a lot of what we believe is attached to another person. Most of what we learn came from another person. For me, growing up, um, I had a, a little bit of a slight issue with male authority. And the reason was because uh, when I was younger, I grew up under sev several strong male authorities in my life, whether that be at church or on the job. And I didn't realize this until years later when I matured spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I didn't realize this until I started looking back and kind of processing what I'd been through, that my relationship with those male authorities was based solely on what I could produce, specifically produce for them. I was always in the good graces of those in authority over me as long as I was doing what they asked. But the second I got out of line, the second I messed up just a little bit, condemnation hit. As long as I was making the boss money, he was happy. The second I wasn't, I got demoted. If I had an off season, they weren't for me. But as long as I was pleasing them, as long as I was doing everything they asked, oh, Stephen, we love you. You're so great. Is there anything you need? And what began to happen is over time, I began to identify the truth that as long as I perform men in authority will love me. And so it didn't matter who it was, my pastor, my boss, my employer, my supervisor, my father, I would try to perform, I would try to achieve, I would try to do more for them so that they would love me more. And what ended up showing up out of that was I actually took that truth that I identified with one person and I attached it to the truth that I identify with my relationship with God. And then I had this realization one day that God only loved me as long as I wasn't sinning. But the second I cussed out the Walmart cashier, the second I flipped off that person in the highway, the second I, I woke up at 2 a.m. and went to that website I shouldn't have been on, the second, am I speaking your truth, not mine? The second I, I all of a sudden, I felt guilt, shame, condemnation. I felt distant from God. And here's why. I was told that sin distances me from God. That God was not for me as long as I sinned. That I would be under a curse as long as I sinned. Sin has consequences, earthly consequences. You sin, there are some consequences. But I believe that God did not love me anymore. And so what I would do is I would take weeks after I sinned and I would try to focus on not sinning and I would try to focus on doing a lot of good things so that I could come back into God's good graces. But here's what I failed to miss. I, I failed to realize. I failed to realize that I was always in God's good grace. 
before I sinned, while I sinned, and after I sinned. Because God's grace is not determinant on whether or not I do the right thing. His grace is determinant on my faith in Jesus. And it would have helped me so much in my life if I had sinned and immediately said, no, Holy Spirit, convict me of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I would not have to try to prove myself and prove myself to God and prove myself to God and wear myself out trying to do better just to get in God's good graces again. No, His grace is always good. It's always there for me. It's His grace that transformed me. The power of truth is important. It's personal. Here's why I believe that Jesus voiced to us who the Holy Spirit is as a person. First of all, he uses the word he to describe the Holy Spirit. Because if you think of the Holy Spirit as an it, you won't have a relationship with him. You don't have a relationship with your refrigerator. Well, actually, I take that back. Some of y'all might. <laughs> Sometimes I do. I got to be honest. <laughs> Woo. I feel like let's get it on, please. Every time I come on and I'm like, open that door. Oh, let's get it on. Yes. Woo. We don't have a relationship with inanimate objects. We don't have a relationship with it's. We have a relationship with he's and she's, with they's. Though we believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. When Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, here's what he says. He says, I will send him to you, and he will only speak what I tell him to speak. Jesus is saying this, don't identify the Holy Spirit with another person other than me, because I'm going to give you a new title for the Holy Spirit. He's not just the Holy Spirit. He is literally the Spirit of Jesus. The reason why we get so messed up in our identities of who the Holy Spirit is, is because we have based our truth on the Holy Spirit with someone who we interacted with in a past life. Maybe you had a great, great Aunt Gertrude who grew up in the super old school Pentecostal church and she wore dresses from her ears all the way down to her toes and she said, you're not allowed to wear makeup or pants, young lady, or you will burn in the pits of hell because you got a demon on the inside of you. And she liked to point out all your flaws and all your sins and she liked to ronda shonda with the best of them and you'd wake up in the morning and she'd pull you aside and trying to cast the demon out of you for no good reason. And so when you think of the Holy Spirit, you think of great, great Aunt Gertrude and how judgmental she was and how condemnational she was and how hateful she was. You think of how racist she was. And when you think of the Holy Spirit, you think of great, great Aunt Gertrude. Or maybe you grew up in a church where the Holy Spirit was always, quote, unquote, flowing and so the pastor would do an altar call at the end for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he'd say, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, you can get it today. And then he'd put a number on it. We're not moving on until we get 23 people. The Holy Spirit says, Psalm 23, 23 people today. And he's got 18 people in the church. He's trying to perform a multiplication miracle right there and then. How are you going to do that? And all you heard for four hours while Golden Corral is opening and all the Baptists are getting the good chicken, <laughs> was the pastor praying in tongues, forcing people to come up. And finally, you're like, fine, I'll take the Holy Spirit. Yes, if it gets me to food faster, that's fine. <laughs> and so you identify the Holy Spirit as a bother, as a burden, not a person. Maybe you grew up around people who claim they were Christians, they claim they had the Holy Spirit. But when they identified themselves with the Holy Spirit, everything that flowed out of them from the Holy Spirit was painful and hurtful and abusive. We're going to talk about this in a later week, but the Apostle Paul says this. He says, test the spirits. A lot of us, we identify the truth of the Holy Spirit with a person we interacted with. And I want to just challenge you today. You have to reshape your thinking to understand that the person of the Holy Spirit is not your great, great Aunt Gertrude. It's not the pastor you grew up with. It's not even me today. It's not the person sitting next to you. The person of the Holy Spirit is simply Jesus. And when you understand that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, then 
every word that flows, when people say it is the Holy Spirit, you can look at it and go, wait a minute, would Jesus say that? Would Jesus act that way? Because maybe it wasn't the Holy Spirit, maybe it was a demonic spirit that was acting like the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't think demons know how to speak in tongues, they can Ronda Shandai with the best of them. They know. They've been in heaven. They know the language. We have to understand the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of Jesus. He speaks as Jesus speaks. Whatever Jesus receives from the Father, He gives to us through His Holy Spirit. The second point is this. The power of truth is relational. It's not just personal. It's relational. And I know this sounds like the same thing. It's not. Because relationship is less about you and it's more about me. Because for me to be in a relationship, there has to be a level of submission. I have to be willing to submit some things to the people I'm in relationship with. Now, I know some people think submission is a dirty word. Submission is not about the power of the other person. Submission is about your inner power to choose who you submit to. It takes a lot more power for me to submit to someone else than it does for them to force me into submission. I have to choose to submit. A healthy relationship requires some kind of submission. In John 14, Jesus said this, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him because He dwells with you. He will be in you. The power of truth is relational because it requires an intimate knowledge, an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit to know that's who He is. I have to submit myself into a relationship with the Holy i got to stop fighting the Holy Spirit. The reason why people have schizophrenic truth where, where they can't really stand on an idea, they don't really know what they believe, is because they have yet to submit to someone. Those you submit to, that's the truth you're going to receive the most. And as followers of Jesus, we have to learn to submit to the spirit of Jesus first. The ability to receive truth is directly related to your ability to submit. And the last point is this. The power of truth is total and complete freedom. John 8 says this, Jesus said uh, to the Jews who believed him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And some of y'all have heard this before, and the truth shall what? Make you free. Man, that's a good message right there. But listen to what he says, six chapters prior to talking about the Holy Spirit. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Isn't it ironic that Jesus talks about the spirit of truth receiving the word of Jesus and speaking it and declaring it to us, and that same spirit of truth is the same truth that will set us free? The reason why the power of truth is freedom because it takes the performance burden off of me. It takes the achievement burden off of me. It takes the confusion burden off of me. Jesus said in John 16, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you, not force you, not pound you. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. What if we had the realization that the Holy Spirit can literally tell us about things that have not happened yet in our lives and prepare us for what was to come? A few years back, I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit and the freedom behind the power of truth. Revived Church was growing, and as any pastor will tell you, when the church is growing, it's because your preaching is amazing. That's a joke. That's not true at all. But we were growing, and I thought, man, this is great. This is awesome. And so we had this year where new people were showing up out of the blue. We didn't know who they were. For the first time, it wasn't like friends of friends. It was like just people finding the church. And we were so excited, man. We were just uh, celebrating this. And so it, it nears the end of the year, and I go to God, and I said, God, I want to know the word for the new year for Revived Church. And I like to joke about this because pastors, for whatever reason, for decades now, whenever they have a word from the Lord for the new year, it has to rhyme or else it's not from the Holy Spirit, you know? God said you're going to be fine in 99. Oh, Jesus. He's doing it again in 2010. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know why we do that, but anyway. So I was like, God, give me the rhyme for the time. Come on, let's do this. And so I'm seeking after God. I'm praying. I'm waiting. 
And I'll never forget, I heard the Holy Spirit. It wasn't audible in my ears, for those of you who are wondering. It was just this impression on my heart. I just received this. He said, get ready. I was like, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. God about to blow the roof off this place. We're going to have 10,000 people by Sunday. It's going to be so good. You know what he said? He said, get ready. The, shrink is, the, shirt, the church is going to shrink by half. <laughs> Not today, devil. Oh! Get out of my life. I was like, that ain't Jesus. But man, I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I knew who it was. It was God. Holy Spirit said very clearly, the church is going to shrink by half. Now, I did not get up the following Sunday and tell the church, the word of the Lord this year is the church is going to shrink by half. I did not set up a, a, a sign-up sheet in the back. If you plan on leaving this year, if you'll just sign up and let us know ahead of time, that way we can count your tithes and offerings as not on the budget. That will help us a lot this year. We didn't do any of that. In fact, I didn't even tell the church. I preached a message at the beginning of the year. I don't even remember what it was, but, you know, just going to do this. And I remember specifically why this was so freeing. Because in February of the new year, so it's only been a month and a half, two months, I got invited to go speak at someone's church. And um, while I'm there, th this guy took the mic and he was a self-proclaimed prophet, an apostle, and, and you know he has the word of the Lord and he speaks for God and, and whatever. And he took the mic and the reason why this was important is because a door for relationship had opened up with him. And so I kind of had a little bit of a not so sure feeling about this guy, but I wasn't sure if that was just me or if that was actually God. And so I went to go speak at his church to kind of feel that vibe. And uh, I preached the most amazing message of my life, of course. It was great. Um, I remember he got up. He grabs the mic. He said, Pastor Kilgore. God has given me a word for your life. He wants you to know that you need to get ready. And I thought, get ready? That's what God said to me. This must be God. Let's hear what he says. Get ready to double everything. God's going to give you a second campus. The money's going to double. The people are going to double. Your influence and your power is going to double. The word of the Lord for this year is revived church is going to double. And I stood there and I said, that is not the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> a lot of times we think that the Holy Spirit, His truth is what we want to hear. But what if the power of the truth of the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with what you want to hear, but what was actually going to happen? Now, if I had chosen to listen to that man's word and whatever spirit that was, rather than listening to God's spirit who spoke to me in a private place, guess what I would have done as a pastor? I would have gone and taken out a million-dollar loan to build our second campus. I would have preached harder and harder than I ever have before. I would have tried new fundraisers and new invitations. I would have tried all this different stuff, trying to get people in the doors because his word to me was everything's going to double. And what I would have seen that year as I worked and worked and blood and sweat and tears, what I would have seen is the church shrink by half. And I would have spiraled into a deep depression. And I would have thought, if only I had done more. I would have thought, God, maybe I'm not good enough. I would have thought, God, maybe I sinned somewhere along the way. And that's why you haven't blessed us with the word that you gave us. I could have chosen the word that I wanted to hear, but I chose the spirit of truth whom I know. And let me tell you why it brought me freedom. Because that year, it was just me and Jesus. I wasn't worried about growing the church. We weren't doing crazy ideas that year, I just preached. I just listened to the voice of God. I said, God, what, is our, what, are, what are these people, need? What, are, what does half the church need? And I'm just going to grow them. If that's who you gave me, I'm going to grow them. So you just tell me. I didn't have to perform for anybody. It brought me so much freedom because as the church shrank, I remember our leaders sat down one day and we're in a meeting and they said, oh man, we've had a lot of people leave this year. And I kind of like spoke up. I said, yeah, I probably should have told y'all. Um, kind of knew this was happening, but it's okay. That year was the highest year of giving in our church's history up to that point. 
with half the church. That year, our church gave away more money than it ever had in any year prior with half the church. That year, we had more spiritual growth than any year prior with half the church. And in that year, I realized something, that my relationship with the Holy Spirit is not about information, it's about relationship. The more that I have a relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the more he's going to speak truth to me, the less I have to work at things, the more he will let me know of things to come. And by the way, just to let you know good news, the word of the Lord for this year is not the church is shrinking, okay? <laughs> just in case you were wondering, we're not shrinking this year. That's not what God told me. But I, I, I really, I, I feel strongly about this message and because I know that sometimes there are people who will sacrifice choices. They'll sacrifice their life for something because somebody in authority or someone that they perceive to have the Holy Spirit speaks something to them, and it's contrary to what they know God has told them. And then when everything blows up, they wonder why. It's because you you got to test the spirits. you got to start practicing a life where you receive the truth, the power of the Holy Spirit is truth, and that truth is not informational, it's relational. It's relational. 